and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. One, one half of the of the two-man duo creating the Veil Riders TTRPG, the one and only Guard Bro. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Like I was telling you earlier, I was doing a little bit of wargaming today and do some painting, so it's a nice, easy day for Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, su Sunday is supposed to be a day of rest. Supposed to be. Yeah, supposed to be. <laughs> That's the thing, supposed to be. So... I sp I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, the how humble did you beginnings. How did you? What's your first introduction to tabletop, and what made it stick? So, tabletop for me first began in I think it was called Bogdorf, Germany, where my dad was stationed, and he was getting the 40k during the 90s in mm -hmm. War of Fantasy. So I was first exposed to kind of like the role playing slash wargaming aspect back when I was like. <sighs> Uh, like the, uh, the 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 single age digits back in Germany, and since then it, it kind of, it's just kind of been that thing I've just kind of grown up with. I've always been around uh, Dungeon Dragons and War Gaming, 40k Fantasy, Pathfinder, uh, you know, all those games. And it's kind of just been a an outlet for me in a way, you know, a way to go out and be social and talk to people and wear proper clothes and get out of a, like here at home. I'm only wearing pajamas. Like I don't like wearing pants. So like. Going out and playing war games was I saying like I'd go get, like do my hair up, put on proper pants, you know, put on shoes and go do stuff. It's a for me it's like a social event. And uh and then role playing tabletop came really into play, I would say, in my in my early teens. So it was a way for us to get to mischief without actually going and getting in legal trouble. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can go and drink at bars and uh, chase goblins and fight gods and you do it all via a um, my damn phone's on do it in a you know a safe uh, less than lethal <laughs> uh, paper version and I think it was let me think here maybe third edition D D when I started really getting into the whole uh, game mastering aspect of it for sure because uh, I realized that most of the fun, was in game mastering or, or, or dungeon mastering, whatever you want to call it. And that's when you get into world building. You build characters and NPCs and plot lines and all. That's when the real magic happens because um, I think being a player is the easy part. You show up, you do things, and you leave, you know? <laughs> like, I, I realized I was getting quite bored being a player sometimes because you kind of, you know, there's not really much for you to do. You craft your character's backstory, which is always fun. It's always fun to make your own your, your own backstory for a character. But afterwards, it's like, ho hum! I'll wait for my turn. You know, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So, where, do you, um, you admit you had mm -hmm. mentioned doing war gaming er earlier? Is are there what sort what sort of war gaming? Di um, would you say would you say you frequent? Is it mostly was it mostly still forty k or did you jump around? Believe it or not, I fell out of love with 40k a couple editions back. I didn't like where it was going, so I I pivoted towards um, a game called Ninth Age, which was a mm -hmm. a fantasy derivative, and I started playing a lot of uh, Star Wars Legion in X Wing. So I I found much more enjoyment in those games than others. Uh, but then of course there's there's Tenth Ed coming out here soon for 40k, so maybe they'll they'll rekindle that love. But for the most part, I play a lot of uh, uh, Star Wars space pew pews with Legion and X Wing. I, I I enjoy I enjoy the hell out of those, mm -hmm. and um, that's really what I've been doing for the past. I would say six years is mostly Legion or X Wing or Ninth Age. Or I dabbled in in WAP, <laughs> the Warhammer Army Project. I hate I hate how they call it WAP. I just it, I, I hear that song in my head every damn time. I've never uh, even heard that song. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's a, uh, a a deviant earworm for sure. <laughs> I'll say that much. And I can I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. I've um I did I did have my own falling out with with um with war with Warhammer. Um, yeah. Grant granted, um when it came to Warhammer and and forty k, I would I would spend more time with the 
with the role playing games than I did the war games. As mm-hmm. far as war, as far as war gaming went, um, the t- the two mainstays that I've gone with for the longest for the last few years have been um, Infinity and uh, War uh, Machine. Infinity. Um, ah, War Machine. That that game had such promise, and it went it, it went bad so fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> These these days, I'm keeping an eye out on on a project called War Surge, which is meant to be a mm. universalist war game. <laughs> um, a universalist war game. Yeah. What is that exactly? The idea. Now, I've in, I will admit I've in, I've interviewed the devs of it um, a while back. The idea mm. is a a rule set that you can use that, that you can use any kind of miniatures on. Basically, ta- basically. Take oh, okay. The universalist approach of say of say GURPS. And applying mm-hmm. it to war games, just without as much calculus, because yeah. a uh, model agnostic game, you can bring yeah. whatever. Mm. Uh, and especially since there's cer- there's certain there's certain factions throughout uh, throughout other media that I think would I think would work great for um, war games, but I don't but I don't want to um, put a round peg in a square hole, like say the Covenant in Halo. I know that some people mm. I know that some fans did make a. Um, codex for the covenant to use 40k setup, but I'd ra- I'd rather do I'd rather do something that isn't constrained by some of 40k's quirks. That is definitely a round a uh, round a uh, round peg in a square hole kind of thing because I mean at that point, you're off making an actual um, you know uh, Halo <laughs> war game at that point, which I know that some guys tried to do. I know. Someone out there tried to make a Halo War game. Um, there was there was one that went that came out around 2016, um, but I don't I don't think it went far enough. No, see, I, I remember like I, I heard of it, I never saw it. I didn't hear any news on it, so it kind of just faded from memory. Really, well, with me, I like, I was aware it was happening, and that's one of the sad things though is when these games kind of fade from memory. It's uh. It's kind of like watching the death of a book. Yeah, it, it's 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 an odd feeling, and I, I can't quite put it in words. But when a game dies, you know, because because a game it was popular at one point had a large community, right? Like like say Warmer Horrors or War Machine, huge community, tons of players, great models, and then one day it's like it's like coming upon a city that you knew was like was bustling and rife, and the next year you come back and it's a ghost town and buildings are ruined you're just like well what the what the hell happened here mm-hmm. and it is kind of it is kind of sad when you when you see it uh and i think it's kind of the nightmare that every game designer has whether it's for an rpg game or a war game i think they'll have the nightmare of what if my game just dies and mm-hmm. it's a thing where games are required to adapt and overcome and some games just don't do that and when they don't adapt and they don't kind of uh refresh things from time to time or some or somehow build a hype and you know the games will simply just cease to exist and like my biggest fear for sure is what if my game just fades the dark and no one ever plays it you know it's like oh i'll be crushing because every game designer every publisher every tester they all they put a lot of love in these games a lot of effort and hours and blood and toil in these games and it, I've I've seen guys where they made their own game, they did a Kickstarter to get a little bit of money, and they try to put it out, and then I watched their soul get crushed because no one wants to buy it or play it, and it hurts them emotionally and spiritually. You know, like their little war gamer spirit gets hurt. <laughs> it's just like it's the worst fear that any of us have for sure, and it's why um, it's always important to kind of push the envelope one way or another. Like when you think about it, uh, there's this horrifying game called Fatal. We we all know about Fatal. I'm yeah, sure. but I... the game is probably never going to die because it pushed the envelope so hard it became infamous. So it's but you got to be careful. You got you got to balance that uh, that 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 notoriety up and down mm-hmm. because if you're too notorious, no one's going to play it out of fear. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know what I mean. Just out of curiosity, when you were playing Warhammer, what um what army did you focus with? Uh, I focused on orcs. I was uh, um, speed freaks orcs, and I played Imperial Guard with mass infantry. With uh, um, I, I specialize in weapons teams the most: mortars, um, heavy bolters, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Right now, I've got Eldar. I bought a combat patrol because I'm I'm kind of like leaning towards like maybe tenth. That'll be good. So I have Eldar now. It's actually a, a, a mild, a mildly well-known story in my fan base. Is how I lost my models. Um, 
I had a rather spiteful ex-girlfriend who um, I, br- I broke up with her. Now, usually what happened is she would swing by uh, my mom's house and grab my models. And then we link up because she lived our, our school is way off, way off away, but she lived closer than I did. So she would get home first, grab my stuff, and then I swing up, pick her, pick her up, and we head off. Just kind of save time, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, we, we broke up. But I failed to tell my mom we had broken up. So old girlfriend swings by, hey, I, I, I need Garbro's models. So here you go. She took these, I these you know those those ancient black carrying cases that were pl- like hard plastic. I think each each box had like almost five to six grand of models in it. And she burned those bastards in her, in her backyard and left this huge slag of plastic on the front porch. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so, so more or less, with this Eldar army, I'm kind of starting from scratch. Um, I have I have every faction of the Star Wars League. I, I got I got uh, rebels and, and Empire and clones and droids for it for for loot. but I, I enjoy like the hobby aspect more so than the actual gaming aspect i like putting things together painting them making them your dudes you know it's, it's kind of like to my, in my opinion the greater aspect of the war gaming and rpg hobby mm-hmm. <laughs> um i will admit that at one at one point when i did when i was playing fairly regularly i had had this combination of salamanders and um imperial guard Mm-hmm. Um, whose whole who whose whole whose whole thing was was well um that's an that's an that's some that's some nice armor you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. <laughs> if I just ignored that, no. <laughs> um, just blow right through it, yeah. But and and I will I will admit at one point I did I did abuse one of the mo- one of the more unfortunate unique characters in the um I, in IG's lineup and ha- mm-hmm. and had the creed maneuver at least once <laughs> the creed maneuver are you familiar with Usakar E Creed who became who became something of a meme it, 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 it I should know it I really should but it's not quite active remember I I, I had three TBIs in the army so some things are just black walls yeah. I can't remember it so go um, refresh me on it <laughs> he he's a, he's a the rule he had a rule called tactical genius where any um unit that he that he was attached with became a scout unit now the key word here is any unit so people so people would make scout warhound titans <laughs> Mm-hmm. Scout, Scout, Warhound, Titans. Yes, Jesus. So, so the army's just the army's just ha- so the opponents just going up, going along the battlefield, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, four Titans show up. This does not seem. But this is one of those things with forty k. It's just like even now, the range and, leth- and lethality for the amount of space you have to play on is, is absurd, and it's always these small things that get overlooked. When making games, like you have uh, a unit of five dudes throwing forty attacks at thirty inches, well, you're only playing on like a three foot board to start out with. So it's, I, it's weird watching the evolution of, of some things. Like, um, oh, just how things change. Forty Ks change for the worse, I think. It may change for the better. How like D and D five E, you know, you have these hor- these like horribly awesome, powerful wizards that can have spell slots and you prepare spells despite being wizards <laughs> you know, it's a those little bitty tiny things that kind of like kind of bring things to a skittering halt with some games mm-hmm. and in all fair in all fairness the um the tiny things getting overlooked is not necessarily a new thing in game design not um, so no not <laughs> not at all <laughs> one one of the one of the big one of the big examples i always bring up when it comes to video games is um bxr back in halo 2 because the idea with the battle rifle was supposed to be the jack of all trades weapon in in Halo Two, but because of a because of a bug that people found where you could instantly um, cancel a melee animation to start shooting, it became a, it became a close range weapon. You do have to you it does take some skill to get the timing down, but those who know how to do it would you would use it quite a bit. Hmm. Um, Saying that's probably. Probably the uh, pro Halo players. You're really worried about that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and of of course, the, of course, um, the the other one which was used a lot more frequently in um, Smash Brothers 
was wave dashing. The idea is you di is you dash di you uh, dash diagonally downwards. You still can you still keep the momentum and are going along the ground a lot faster than running. Hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's it's, 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 it's so do like the frames how you just kind of like just kind of going along or some damn thing and you kind of skitter across faster than yeah. actually running. Yeah. Yeah, and I. I'd like. To, I know it'd be easy to say that that, that that's that that's like a pro strategy, ex except you, you look and <laughs> pro say, gamer strat. <laughs> you look and say um, speed running commun in communities. You'll find you'll find exploits for days. It get it's 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 honestly a bit cra it's honestly a bit crazy how how far people will will go to shave just a few seconds off their runtime. Yeah. Uh -oh. oh geez, like. What was that thing people do in like speed runners? Like they do like the backwards hop because designers yeah. didn't have like a speed cap going backwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's one. That is one example. Um. Yeah, <laughs> I just remember that shit. <laughs> but now, when it came to when it comes to Veil Riders, as I understand it, this was or this was was this originally a can. This was originally a campaign, and you decided to make into it into its own thing. Well, so it was actually a book. I was just going to write a book. Um, I had just gotten done. Fi I had just gotten done doing the All Skeleton Party campaign, which is another. Um, I don't want to say like famous. Famous sounds like a, like like a horn toot. Uh, a well known internet campaign. It basically, I I, I DM for a bunch of skeletons in D and D five E setting. And I was kind of right. I was kind of riding that wave. I was like, you know, I want to write a book because I figured it'd be fun to <clears throat> kind of write a book based on D twenty rolls, right? So, like with the Veil Rider book or the Emily Bronze book, I, when I'm writing, I'm rolling D twenties to see what happens with the characters. And uh, while I'm doing this, the first book was like halfway through, I think, or something like that, and people are like, hey make a D&D &D 5e module for this. So it's not really a campaign. It's actually just, just a, a story, a book series I was writing as an audio drama for YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I, I, I can do a 5e module, no problem. Until I realized that 5e was not built to handle M16s and 50 cals and AT4s. I was like, that's not going to work, you know? So I started, I started kind of building a whole new um, system, really, or, or a game system. Now, it's very hard to be original, in 2023 almost everything is derived from something so i i, I took that mat, 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 matter of life like i can only be so original when i do this i started trying to started just trying to find the good things from all these game systems and try and build them into this nice little mishmash of a system that players would really enjoy playing in a system where gms or cc's as they're, as they're called in my game a combat controller could more proficiently run a game and it kind of just became the Veil Rider TTRPG. Um, it uses like a you know uh, action point system. There's no you have two actions. You have a whole list. You have it's skill by no more randomizations. You generate attributes from the skill by themselves. It's, it it started as a please make a D and D five E modules, and it became a whole entire game, which now includes a monster manual and a CC manual. It just kind of, and it all spawned from this, uh, the American Isekai story I was writing just for fun. Because, um, well, when, when you're a DM, you're always writing a book one way or another. It's just that the there are players in that book meddling with things, you know. And so, a lot of GMs are, as you write your campaign, you're typing it up, you're, you're literally writing a story. The problem is, your main characters have, you know, opinions <laughs> that they can do things in. Mm -hmm. And I figured I would have fun doing a story based on D twenty rolls, and and now it's this this thing. <laughs> I'm not. It's it's honestly uh, surprising to me. Uh, it, it, you kind of it seems more and more that some people take some things for granted. I I, I, love to, I never take for granted the fact that this was simply an idea I had at one day, and now it's this you know, this game that's got currently got twenty two thousand dollars on Kickstarter. Yeah, it's just it's just like how the hell did I get here? A lot of times, um, and like I said, I, uh, I I I stream the games on Twitch, and people are always surprised to see this this thing going. You got elves and heads or tanks running around trying to shoot dragons in the face with sabo rounds. It's just it's it's just a new a new outlet to do wacky things with your friends, except it's a little more fast paced. 
I would say. Yeah. And for for what it's worth, the the whole notion of take of taking of going with D&D as a start and then and then um evolving it in, evolving into its own thing, you're in good company when it comes to that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, putting aside the fact that that's that there was a similar um, origin story with the get with um with something that I interviewed about about 24 hours ago. Hmm. Um, there's st- stuff like chivalry and sorcery and role master. That's how they started out. Ah, okay. Um, originally, the, originally it was just how ho- it was just house ruling D and it was just house ruling D and D, and then just kind of exploded out exploded out of that. Um, hmm. especially role master. Role master originally was just a bunch of house rules for AD and D. Okay, um, gotcha. Yeah, and the, and then it's then it then it became then it became its own thing. Uh, so there so there's so there's most certainly a precedent. Uh, and when it come when it comes to when it comes to veil when it comes to veil writers, um, mm-hmm. one of the things that that was brought that was brought up v- very early on on the Kickstarter was it using an action point system and i'm curious what brought what brought what brought on the around the idea of using action points instead of um a action t- a tiered set of actions as is usually done mm. um one of the things i never liked as a gm was when a player wanted to do something right they wanted like can i do x y and z i'm like well no because they only have one action or right? You only have one bonus action. I found that kind of system really constricting for creativity. And it kind of created this problem where players are trying to like work around and break things and try and combine all these actions into one thing. And it, I prefer for my players or players in general to have a far larger breadth of things they can do. Like in, like in, like for, with, with the AP system, say your buddy is out of AP. Like, fuck. You as in the player, say you have three AP left, you can reload their... You can reach over, load their rifle for them, and prepare them for their next turn. It allows players to not only store actions and react more appropriately to an active combat environment, it allows them to help out other players beside them. So, like, a, a great example is... Uh, there's a guy uh, was using a, a crew serve 240. Boom, boom, boom. He's full auto... Moon folks down, but you know, there's a lot of enemies coming their way. I think the guy was pushing goblins toward them, uh, and he has he's he out of AP and he couldn't reload. A guy behind him ran up, used his AP to reload his weapon, and then went up and fired boom, 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 and threw out grenades. It just allows players to more properly role play a active, you know, um, rifleman because it because we think about it in in you see the, the two action system. You one action to to attack, one action to reload. That's not a lot, <laughs> you know. Like I and when I did tests, because the early game did use a three action system. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they use fire, reload, fire, and players thought it was heavily. It was really boring. <laughs> like man, this is really boring. I don't like this. Like it was, it was an action to drink drink a health potion or use your IFAC or a tourniquet. You know, they're like this is sucks. I don't like this. And they said it doesn't really uh, properly give them the things they want to do. And it's not a lot of like risk because you can't like, you know, like with like the current system, you could spend a lot of AP and hope you get more back or you can kind of uh, bogart your AP and kind of wait for a big moment. Not to mention like, you know, uh, you spend AP like say, say like I, I need more movement. I want to do more movement. You can spend AP to get five more feet of movement. So you have, so you have your regular movement of like 30 feet per se. Mm-hmm. And you go, I want to get away from that fucking grenade. You can spend five, uh, you can get five more feet per one AP. So you're able to push out that, uh, that movement by simply using your, your AP points. And I, and it seemed to me, um, of course, this may be me, me just, you know, huffing my own farts at this point, but it seemed to me that players were having more fun and having more, breadth of action by having these AP, these action points. And of course, there's an AP pool, and then you have AP region. So they're able, they're able to kind of mentally bank on, okay, I'm going to have free AP next turn. I got to use these things carefully. I can store an AP, or I, I can try and you know push out AP. It, it gives them 
more things to think about and keeps them engaged. Uh, I know with D and D five e, I would have I would, I would have players check out because I only have two actions. And they, and they like they'd be on their phone or you know eating nachos and not paying attention. When you know your three AP could keep your friends alive or or, or they could die, people were you know players were watching the game far more closely and thinking I'm going to use an AP for this, two AP for that, and then we'll try and move here. Because as well in the game, you know you can uh, we, we we there's no. Uh, AC, it's a DR, a, a defensive rating. And you can boost your DR, make yourself harder to hit by getting behind cover. Like, say you're, behind, say you're wearing a plate carrier, you know, DR 15, for example. And you're like, man, I'm staring down a tank barrel. If I dive behind this tree, I'm now DR 20, you're harder to hit. Uh, it's just, I want players to interact with the game a bit more than what they were doing and the best way to do that as far as i could tell or test was this action point system i know a few more use it like uh um dames of astoria uses a ap system and a few more mm-hmm. do and it's just i get why some players wouldn't like an ap system it can get confusing you gotta track certain things you know you got you got a little die track in your ap you got Remember what AP costs are. You know, saying I want to do this as an action is a lot easier, sure, but it's also more constraining. And I don't want to constrain players. I don't want to constrain people to have to walk down a very narrow corridor. I want freedom of action, most mm-hmm. of all. Yeah, not, I can I can certainly get that. Uh, it is fu- it is funny that both that on um, both were both games that I've cut co- this Veil Riders and the game I covered yesterday. We're both doing wanted to do AP systems um, for mm-hmm. similar but different reasons. Um, in his in his case, it's that sometimes there's this entire action type that you're just not going to be using, such as um, if you're in if you're in me- if you're in melee combat, then all any of the options that are that would you're not really going to be concerned with minor actions, even though you're even though you get a minor action. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because you're, you're melee. You can't really like you know, like reach around and grab a pot or or uh, or a healing potion or open a bag up or grab a door. You're just you're in melee. Yeah, mm-hmm. I can see that. So it's so it's a ca- so it's a case of the, you have this whole avenue you have this whole avenue of the action economy that you're you're just not going to be using. It's kind of wasted. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to action points, there there is a there is a degree of freedom, especially when you can ca- you can kind of put a guideline as far as how as far as how much um, AP an action should cost. Because because I th- I get the feeling that you, that your mindset is for is um some something that can be done in a few seconds that's one AP something that would require a bit more extensive. Um, use would be two AP, and something that would require a lot of effort is three. Yeah, and it's really important to get a lot of feedback on those kind of actions because reload because reloading, you know, you get you got a drop magazine, pull out new magazine, slap in magazine, two AP. Uh, if you get really good at it, it's one AP because there's there's certain jobs where when you get a certain level, yeah, you can reload for one AP or you can unlock certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, Another big thing was like just these minor things like pulling out and drinking a potion. You know, you can bite a cork out and drown a potion for one AP or two AP, depending on what it is you're doing. It's really hard to balance that because you don't want the AP system to be like punishing. That's not the point of what it wanted to do. Same times, it can't be too cheap or they're be popping all these all all these actions and completely fouling up the economy. You know, to their advantage. It's um. It's definitely a tightrope walk because you can say you have three actions and you're done. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll figure it out myself. Mm-hmm. When you have, you know, he, here's this pool of AP, here's the action costs. You know, people go, mm, and they can kind of, if you're not careful, they can very easily abuse that system and just make things absolute hell for the CC, <laughs> which, you know, it's just one of those things. You, you just got to, like, for me, this book's coming out. And it's going to be a PDF for at least a couple months or if not a year. Because I don't want to sell a product that's completely bored. It's going to need fixing. And now you have a physical product. Okay, this book's useless. Because buying a couple 40K codexes will teach you that lesson very quickly, <laughs> to say the least. So this book's going to say a PDF, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be fed feedback. That's all going to fixing that PDF. I know I could just cheap it out, print it out, call it a day, no fixes. But I'm trying to make a book that 
is a premium experience for players and CCs. And the one way you do that is with feedback and balancing, but you got to do it in a certain way to where it's not going to just completely break the game or make it worse. And mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing is that when you look at D and D five E or 40 K, these are huge um, community processes. You know, you have all these people that do certain things. It's got to go through all these channels. And with me, it's far easier. It's just, it's just me doing it. There's no, there's no committee to go like, okay, we got to change the Eldar or how do you we'll talk to the Eldar team. It's just me going, okay. He said, I have 14 guys saying it's too expensive. I'll drop it by one AP and call it a day. You know, it's far, it's a lot easier. Plus I can go, it's change, put on a PDF and you're, and you're and off you go. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's it's gonna be hard for sure. Nothing here is easy making a game. It's got I think a lot of guys don't take criticism easily when they make games. They tend to just kind of explode or implode with feedback. You just gotta you gotta learn to just go, okay, you know what? I have thirty seven people telling me this thing is broken. I should probably listen and find a way to fix that. Take feed feedback is so important for everything mm-hmm. that is ever made. And I I hope I get feedback because 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 they get no feedback. I'm thinking is are people afraid to talk to me? What's wrong? <laughs> you know, because I'm I am in no way assuming my product is perfect. I expect feedback, and my biggest fear is not getting feedback and going and balancing things and figuring out and correcting these issues. Mm-hmm. And f- for me, my um, I've 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 tried I've treaded carefully when it comes to feedback because. There's the good kind of feedback, and then there's the kind of feedback uh, that's rooted in somebody biased about their particular end of the spectrum not getting enough attention. So it's one, yeah, it's one yeah. of those it's one of those things where where you have to you have to be careful. Um, <laughs> yeah. When now when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the um. Le- the leveling the leveling setup i did i did see that you have a some something equivalent to a cl- to a class system in in the form of the handful of jobs that you have but yeah yeah what I, the vibe that i i get the feeling of is is that this is this is very much a class centric affair since it lo- it looked like leveling in a class is not is not just going to be a static modifier in that in not in the class in a um, skill is not just a static modifier in that one, but it has impact elsewhere. Yeah. So more or less try, trying to be different. You know, you want, you want to stand out a little bit, not too much to where you can get flogged and put on a, a, you know, a, a sewer drain, but it's enough where you, you stand apart. Just, just a little bit. And, we, and what me and pirate figured is, is that it may behoove us to make it to where checks and saves actually behave differently. So in most games, checks use a, use a skill. And for our game, checks are a skill and an attribute. Well, saves are just an attribute. So like say you... Uh, and that and some skills apply towards attacks. So say you have a six, like a five in rifles. Well, when you're using a rifle to attack, you get plus five to that attack in your effective range. Um, just to make, you know... To, to make... And punish like min maxers. So say you want to go, I'm all in sniper rifles. You have plus five in marksmanship and sniper rifles, and you're pumping ballistics, you know, but at the same time, you're gonna be an absolute, you know, nugget in like trying to perceive things <laughs> or like social encounters. And then the jobs are a way to kind of expand out the style you want to play in. We we have a, like a wheelman class, we have a machine gunner class, a demolitionist class, we have a uh, an investigator class, and all these things are their point is to help you play the style you want. If you just want to sling lead down range, there's a machine gunner class and and an auxiliary class where your whole shtick is you're out to destroy things. Yeah. And it's just um, like in D and D fight, there's like a paladin, there's the rogue, there's the the cleric, all that kind of thing. Here's you have a job. Hmm. And most importantly in the game, if you don't like your job, you can learn a new job, you know, like say, you're you're a few months in your campaign again. I don't like being a breacher. I want to be something else. You can go in and relearn another another job, and kind of you know adjust to what you're finding yourself. How you mean a game? Or say like you're in a game. You're like man, we need an investigator. 
and someone draw a short straw, psh, you're going to you're, you're go to investigator school <laughs> and, learn, and learn a whole new job. The point is to be a little more flexible for certain things. Like, like say you're, oh, I don't know, you're two years in a campaign, right? And it's all like riflemen. And you're like, man, where we're going, we're going to need someone to like, you know, defuse explosives because in the campaign, you need to defuse C4 or whatever else. So you have a guy go learn a new job and he's going to pick all the right things. He's going to adjust like certain things, but then he, you can go do that. You can go learn something else. Again, the breadth of choice is what we're going after. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, tr- and I'll, 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 like the whole classic. You're a paladin. That's, that's what you are. And I don't, and, and I never liked multi-classing like a paladin warlock or a ranger cleric. It just seemed weird to me. <laughs> so I figured you, know, you have a job, you learn your job, you do your, the job the best you can you unlock certain some players call them feats i was always call them like bonuses on certain jobs like so like a, like a, like, a, like a breacher can can dual wield two hammers at a certain a certain level you know it's just i, I don't know that's just kind of way we the, kind of the way we took it really it's not really a class it's simply a job you do <laughs> which which i think is reflected in the in the li- in the lists that are that are there um, <clears throat> although, um, especially especially given this, especially given the setting mix you have of um, of mo- of modern te- modern tech, it's modern tech and um, and f- and the fantastical and in a roundabout way, it kind in a roundabout way it kind of reminds me of something I've covered in the past called Lightning War, hmm. uh, which was which was going with the idea of what if, what if a fantasy setting had its own World War Two. Oh, I see. Okay, got you. Oh. Its own uh, major bolt action war, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And but st- still had some, still had some degree of magic. Just technologies moved forward. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where it's, it's probably the most fun when you have that nice little mishmash of technology and magic, and they and they can work together in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, what most folks don't understand is that um, with this game. You're you have, you have skill points. So if you want to be a preacher that heals, you can do. If you want to be a rifleman that uh, is all about tinkering, you can, you can do that. There's all these things you, you can you can kind of do a hybrid without doing a hybrid. It's simply you have your guy. Like say you have a valley elf who's really good at like riding animals, and he takes because you say say you put all, all your skill points in like animal handling and riding and that kind of stuff. But you're still an auxiliary rifleman. You can technically build a mounted cavalry scout with a carbine. You can do that. You, you, you can be a mechanic that can cast really powerful healing magic or explosive magic. Or you know, you, can, you, you it, the skill point system allows for you to kind of, you know, kind of dabble in. Are you more magically inclined, or are you more technologically inclined? Are you using pole arms and hammers, or using rifles and machine guns? You, you, you kind of mishmash things to quite a fair degree. I would say, I hope. <laughs> anyway, and when I think, I think the the other thing that I always have a bit of con- have a bit of concern over when it sh- when it shows up is making sure that sk- making sure that skill systems don't fall into the trap of um, analysis paralysis. And I think I th- I think because of the fact that each each skill, each skill adds to adds a point to one of the co- one of the core attributes. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's going to be an, as much as much of an issue beca- be, simply because investing in a skill is going to be benefiting you two ways. Yeah. It, so sometimes it says, like, say you want more brawn. Some guys will just dump points in, into a skill that just has brawn in it, so they can pump their brawn mm-hmm. uh, modifier. Because I think. Um, you usually fight D five. You you roll for your attributes, right? You roll you roll these D six and you kind of pour out your attributes. I didn't really like that. I didn't like randomizing attributes. I think that certain skills should come with their own bonus. Like say you're a blacksmith, you're going to be a pretty brawny dude. So if you're putting skill points in blacksmith, you you, you can choose brain power or or or, or brawn because you're gonna, you're going to be very knowledgeable how to, how to work steel, and also you're going to be wielding the hammer a lot. So you should be somewhat brawny. I, the this is a, is a two and a goal to allow again more choice for your attributes, but also kind of reflect the skills themselves. You know, because I, I I didn't like how you can have a 
you know, I think it was you use a blast thing skill in uh, DD Five E. I'm not, I'm pretty sure it didn't really add. I think it added a bonus for certain things, but you could have like a brawn of two and, st- and still be a black. Like I guess I'm a very weak blacksmith. I guess it, it just kind of seemed kind of like a, a a nothing kind of skill. Like oh, you're a blacksmith, hooray! You can go make stuff. The but the- random attribute thing, I've always suspected that be that being a artifact of D and D's origins. Mm. The, huh. the randomization of things. Yeah the the ran, the randomization as well as well as the as well as the fact that that was the way to kind of create variety with the with the with the uh, limited space that that you that you could get with those with say um, early white box. Gr- granted, granted, I can't, granted that kind of analogy falls flat on its face once you look at the atrocious once. Once you take into account the only way to really customize was to get spells, <laughs> yeah, or get or get or get equipment, which is, which is um, gonna be one of those things that's dependent entirely on how nice the GM is to you. Mm-hmm. Um, there there are a few, there are a few mechanics that I f- that I found a bit interesting, and I wanted to see what the inspiration for them was. The first one. Is what's referred to in the field guide as brutal ease. Ah, yes. Which, if I'm unless I'm misreading it, the idea is you roll this, you get the AP you spent refunded. Yeah, so brutal ease. Basically, the nat twenty. Sometimes around this shouldn't hit. Like having a nat twenty to where you just lob a lucky grenade down a tank barrel, it's moving at fifty miles per hour. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it seems a bit. It, it it kind of it can kind of ruin some combat encounters, but we still want to reward someone for rolling a natural twenty. It's it's a big deal. It's uh the 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 the, the table hyper in a way, you know. You hit max damage or a nat twenty or the nat one, and so with brutal ease, one of the things where we roll a nat twenty on attack, it simply refunds the AP, and it does help with the action economy. So say you get you know you're you're you're, you're going for a uh, aim shot is three AP from a pool of fifteen. You get that twenty. Well, now you have the three AP back. You can now do something else, or reload, or help a character, or cast, or cast magic. It just kind of keeps the, the the chain going, you know. Mm-hmm. Now the now of course the other thing I was curious about is you you mentioned um you mentioned checks and saves being di- being different and then then of course i came across the whole notion of shattering dice mm-hmm. um which is which for all intents and purposes is what i usually refer refer to as exploding die because i spent yeah. way too much time playing legend of the five rings and i still love that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah and i'm g- what what prompted the idea of doing that when it came to damage dice? Was it a way to make damage die different, or was it to re- was it to reward um, high rollers? I think it was a mixture of many things. To of course build table hype when someone shatters a dice, it's like oh crap, you're doing more damage. But it's also to simulate really da- like really hardcore shot. Like say you get shot in the chest, how, how do you simulate? A really awesome shot on target, and I figured because because usually when you get so trying to simulate getting shot right, say you roll a very little di- okay, you, you can say you roll very little damage, like you roll a d12, you get a, a damage die of two. Okay, well you, you kind of just winged them, you know, kind of like a little flesh wound. But how do you simulate like getting a head shot or like a like you know a gut shot or a heart shot? Well, a way to do that is by having these shattering dice, to where the more the more this damage keeps rolling, bop, 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 bop. It kind of simulates getting a really hardcore shot on target, doing a lot of damage. And of course, when you, when you, when you don't have the the uh, holy cow, nat, nat 20, ooh, 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 that kind of thing, you want to s- still build hype and give players that dopamine hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because um, ro- rolling double damage isn't it on a which is going to have a 5% shot of it isn't, go- isn't going to give them the dopamine hit as much. I know some might say that that makes it more special, but the problem is that's the only way to get that hit. Yeah, and of course we're working with, with with a DR system. Like, say a rifleman shoots at a tank, right? Hmm. A nat twenties. Well, he's still shooting at a tank. What would that nat twenty do? Um, is 
it's a difficult thing to balance because the last thing you want is for a rifleman to shoot and get a nat 20 and hit a tank and explode like <laughs> the tank just it explodes in Hollywood. Um, it's, it's, um, I don't know. I just, it's, it's just an idea that I had and I chewed over this with, with pirate for, for, for a while. Like how do we deal with the nat 20? Cause the nat 20 has grown into a kind of uh, cultural thing. The nat 20 means the best thing happens. Nat 20 is the best thing in gaming. When the D 20 goes to click clack on, on, on a 20, good things happen but this is a game of modern warfare sometimes the best outcome won't be the very best um and it's just um uh, man <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just i think it's more of a balancing thing because the last thing a player wants is to be behind a tree wearing armor and that 20 splices them in the, in, in the cheek and kills them and at the same time you don't want your your your, your big baddie getting domed by a nat 20 and just dying out right or you know a fragile entity that's hiding behind a bunker nat 20 somehow hits them or trying to invent a reason as to why this 556 has gone through a building in a couch and a sofa to hit your target it's just uh, it's i i just got a lot of flack for this for 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 removing the the automatic hitting a nat 20 but i, I think it was, uh, to me it's just the right way to go with it mm. you know it's um a lot of guys don't like that excuse, and I, and I get that. But sometimes you shouldn't always hit. Uh, same thing. Why with like, with like a nat one is simply a jam, and you're rolling a jam chart. You don't want to like have a guy like just throw his rifle through the air for no reason, or falls and trips on a on a bayonet. You know, <laughs> there certain things are easily abusable or are just not as fun. And it's hard to find that balance, both mechanically wise and narratively wise. Mm -hmm. I can get that. Now, in um, since we since we talked about um, act about things accidentally having co having um consequences, um, were during development were there any instances where there was something that you over that you overlooked, uh, at the t at the time and then re and then later on realized wait this is going to cause problems if we don't fix this. <laughs> um a few things yeah <laughs> to say the least mm -hmm. a lot of uh we, we we have one spell called uh combat enhancement which was severely unbalanced where basically you're 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 you're, you're enhancing your 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 friendly party members with magic and it gave them like f 10 times damage and all that fun stuff and as well we had some spells where it would just kill the caster quite easily Weapons weren't all that bad, actually. The biggest balancing things was jobs and magic and explosives. That was <laughs> explosive was another big thing where it's hard to balance because a C4 charge, a whole brick of C4, is a uh, message from God, really. <laughs> when you think about it, when a whole C4 brick goes off, people pay attention. And you're trying to balance out um, that C4 charge, as well as, as, well as the, uh, the 50 cal. We did a lot of testing on the 50 cal and other large bore weapons. And the 50 cal used to do like like there was 5d20 per shot. Problem is, guys are rolling super low and not liking how the M2 really kind of lack lethality. So we need to go in and balance that and change a few things. But for, for the most part, me and Pirate put a lot of thought, forward thought, in the mm -hmm. things we we're doing, and only a few things fell through the cracks so far. Again. When this thing goes live, people are, are, are going to start scrutinizing it. I expect a lot more feedback to come back, a lot more things to fix and change. Because you can't catch everything yeah. designing games. Someone's going to blast through and punch in the nuts. <laughs> it just is what it is. And I, I, I will admit with so, with some mechanics when I needed to use the when I need the high damage weapon, the way I'd reflect that is basically stealing the brutal rule from D and D Fourth Edition. Um, uh, what would that be? Remind me. Um, some weapons would have brutal and then a number. It basically means that if you roll this number or lower on the damage die, you re-roll that die. Oh, really? Okay. Mm. So it's not doing more. It's not doing. It's it's not about doing more potential damage. It's about doing um, put raising the floor, essentially. Ah, I see. Uh, um, well, one thing, one thing to balance with certain weapons is that some weapons do, um, lethal damage. Mm -hmm. So there's only little damage types. There's like lethal and, and fatal and lethal is one of those things where with a ballistic weapon, if that does 
lethal damage, if that damage takes you into the negative HP pool, you die. Like so, so, so in this game, you, you have your regular HP pool and your death HP. So basically, when you when you, when you, when you hit zero and go into ne- into negatives, you're now dying more or less. You, you're 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 kind of your 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 uh, movement is halved. Your AP pool is halved. You may not you can make grit saves and not pass out and die in the battlefield. And there's some weapons where you have to balance those because these things deal out lethal damage. So if that thing puts so this, so say like a uh, 50 cal hits you. And hits you so hard, you go into the negatives. You just die. <laughs> like, say you have the worst rolls ever with something attacking you, and it does like maximum, maximum damage, and you hit negative one, you just die. You just get capped, and you're, and you're done. And it's like, is it now that, th- that those those things should exist for sure because fifty cows are scary as shit. Same time, you don't want it to be so punishing and so easy to get in, into the negative HP pool. It's it's a uh, again, it's definitely a tightrope walk for sure. Yeah, you don't you don't want to have lol surprise you die kind of kind of thing. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, rocks fall, you know that kind of thing. That's something you can get away with in video games. You can't really get away with that in tabletop because dead character means that that person is is gonna have nothing to do but check their damn phones until somebody revives them, if they revive yeah. them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So one thing I will say to 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 alleviate that thing where. You're kind of sticking around to someone picks you up. Is that is that characters in negative HP who are dying can still do things, mm-hmm. um, and it still keeps the player engaged. So say you're negative HP, you can still like wiggle around or help someone reload. You know, it, it becomes kind of a last stand kind of thing where you're dying, but you're still in it. You're, you're, still, you're still trying to be be uh, be effective in your dying state. Like uh, I remember, was one time uh, his, his name is Crusader. He's he's one of the uh, one of my beta testers. He was his character was dying, and he had like f- I think four negative four negative HP left before he died. So he armed two claymores, went click click, and took out like a 20, 30 foot radius of the fucking map, just gone with him, as well as the the enemies. So basically, this wounded and dying character to preserve the other heavily wounded uh, other PCs simply pulled out C four, went click click, see you later, and deleted most of the combat encounter to preserve his fellow players. Hmm. And it's those kind of moments that you really do hope for, where someone goes, you know what? I'm still in it and I can end this. And they do something to not only keep themselves engaged while they're dying. Cause no one likes to be a dying character and just sitting there like, please help me. I'm dead. You know, no one likes to be the guy passed out and the dragons roaring. You're like, I'm oh, sorry, I can't do anything, you know? So hmm. that's one of the things I was looking for that, that kind of thing. And it, it's working out so far. I've had no complaints about it, <laughs> to say the least. I'm hoping we shall see. Mm-hmm. And with with all that in mind, what do you what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the full book? Oh goodness, um, <laughs> not too many pages. But at the same time, it's a pretty pretty big book. Plus, I'm having uh, Chloe Coy do art for it, and she's mm-hmm. doing rather large pieces so right now mind you this is not in 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 column format we're 198 pages but putting things in column format will definitely shrink that down by a very fair margin Mm -hmm. um so so far just the organized field guide is about sixty-three thousand words which is not too bad for a for a book but at the same time um that's the basic manual the combat controller manual is like it's going to be at least 80,000 words when I'm done. Cause I guess another thing we can talk about is the fact that not all the spells are in the manual. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, um, with D and D five E, you just unlock spells. You see, there's no real narrative reason why you know them. You just do, you know, you level eight, you have this spell now. Why? Cause the game says you do. <laughs> there's no like training or books. In, in this game, when you read books and do training, you can learn hidden spells. It, 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 it enables players to go out and try and seek certain things and allows CCs or DMs or GMs to kind of tease out these spells. Like, oh, hey, you've heard Scuttlebutt about a spell that allows you to read people's minds. How do I find that? Well, you got to go find a guy who knows how to do it. You know, you got to go out and try to find a thing that knows a spell and will teach you. Well, this guy doesn't want to teach you. Well, you got to somehow convince him to, and it allows you to kind of build up kind of mini campaigns or mini, mini adventures around learning 
like blood scrying or blood theft or uh, cataclysm. You know, it, it, it makes spells more impactful. And when a character learns a spell, well, they've earned that spell. They went and done things and talked to folks and took time. It, it's far more fulfilling. Like, okay, I've, I've learned, you know, let's say uh, ever filling bowl. I know this and I had to go and do things and know it. It's more of a reward, you know, mm -hmm. than, than, than a simple like, Checkbox unlock. Oh, yeah, I can I can get behind that. Now, with with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the pro for the project? Uh goodness. So I put December as the deadline. It has to be done by December. But I'm reckoning that I can have this book done and dusted, full of art by late summer. Um. At the same time, I am pay paying coders to make a Foundry thing so you can play the game on Foundry with its own particular systems in place. And I am an absolute brain nugget, and I don't really fully understand the mythical powers of coding and the witchcraft they do, so I can't really have a time frame on that. But I will say they have till December to have this thing working. And of course, you see me on Twitch. I'm using that same system and testing it out on the go. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where uh, it's, uh, yeah, so by December, for sure. And, of course, art takes time, writing takes time, feedback takes time. Um, I would reckon this thing should be in its, like, prime state by, like, next spring. As long as people give me feedback I need, I can hammer that shit out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say books should be in full PDF form by late summer, and this Foundry thing should hopefully be done by December. And the hope is that with Foundry, you know, not everyone plays online, or uh, plays in person, which, you know, you should play in person when you can, but sometimes friends move across states. You may have friends in other parts of the country you want to play with, so that's a, that's a big thing. And the Foundry thing will allow you to go click, 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 Make a character, do attacks, do it's it's a, a lot more streamlined. Where say you want to do a, an attack on two things, you'll click, 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 do the attack, click, 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 do the attack. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to use, and it keeps track of your AP and your HP and your death HP and your equipment and all the other nonsense. So it's just a much easier way to play online. Well, of course, it'd be far easier in real life just having a paper going. Okay, I'm plus four to this roll. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops, mm. and and but and the best of luck in all of the insanity that's that is inevitable with these kind of things. Well, I mean, there is the war crime chart, which is, which is causing quite a stir. So we'll see how that how that goes. Oh. Um. <laughs> well, you you can't have war crimes if there's no war going on. Yeah, and, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, war crimes were happening anyway. So I made a way to where war crimes both positively and negatively affect the party. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have a certain war crime score, where well, you're more intimidating, but you're also more reviled. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because a lot of times, say the party burns down an entire orphanage edge as per the murder hobo way, there's no real, like, consequences when they do that. With the war crime chart, there are definitely consequences. And the players are aware of them. Like, hey, all of you know this is a war crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do it anyway. Well, your war crime score is 16 now. Uh, prepare for the Beckham Biggins. Where, say your, war, say your score is 16, cities won't trade with you. Shops won't sell to you. You got to go to black market to find ammunition. You got to, you know, you lose all these things when you do this. Same time, you are highly feared. So it's one of those, you know, things where there's actually consequences for your actions, which is always kind of fun, you know. People love consequences. <laughs> yep. I guess. Yeah. Now, so regardless, I as I said, I will be looking forward to to seeing how to seeing how it works out. Uh, but with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play around here. Mm. Not a problem. I always enjoy doing these. It's, it's always fun. Meet new people and talking to them. It's always fun for me. Yeah, and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for whether it's for Veil Riders or for something else, 
or ju or just to l just to laugh at Games Workshop for the umpteenth time, the <laughs> door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> All right, and I appreciate it, bud. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs> <laughs>